This episode of TechZilla has been sponsored by the fine folks at Domain.com, Appley, and Data Robotics. we got some great stuff coming up on this episode. Kevin Rose is here. He's going to be co-piloting the show. We're going to talk about boosting the range of your cell phone or at least making it work where it doesn't. Maybe. Uh, plus, making sure your shiny new iPhone or your iPod or your Zoom or whatever it is, like a cell phone, doesn't end up with a big scratch screen. And then we got stencils, a festival of stencils and viewer questions, and a lot more coming up on today's TechZilla. Welcome to TechZilla. I'm Patrick Norton. And I'm Kevin Rose. we got a great show lined up for you today. Coming up, we're going to talk about boosting the range in your cell phone, basically protecting the screen on any of your favorite toys, stenciling. I'm very excited about stenciling. Stenciling. You're I, into the stenciling I, well, I've, I've taken pictures of stencils all over the city, and there's, some, there's a real kind of indie underground art thing going on with stencils. And there's some amazing stuff. Well, actually, we'll, we'll flash yeah. some more of those later on. Yes, and of course, we have your questions. But before we begin... I basically recently started using an iPhone, my first new phone in like three years, and there's five things I want to whine about with it. Or as I like to call it, the top five things that are desperately wrong with the iPhone. One, there's still no flash support for the Safari browser. This is pathetic. It's been out for a year. Two, no third-party applications without hacking it, at least until maybe February. Three, Edge, enhanced data rates for GSM evolution. The download speed sucks. Where's the real 3G HSDPA, or as our friends at Singular slash AT&T call it, high-speed downlink packet access. Four, when are we going to have true support for Exchange or Zimbra, and not just IMAP email support so we can use it as something to legitimately complete with a BlackBerry. If you want to use Exchange, get a BlackBerry. Five, that delete expletive headphone jack. Oh, I didn't want to get into it. Did I show you what I did to my headphone jack? I've, I'm right with you. I've like busted my headphones trying to jam it in on the airplanes. It's. I finally took a drill press to it. That is crazy. And I think we... I think we have some stills we can probably cut Something to tells it. me the company paid for this iPhone. You would not no. do this with your own iPhone. No, I actually not only paid for this, but I've, I paid for this out of my own pocket. If you are thinking about doing terrible things to your iPhone in terms of opening up the uh, jack, I would definitely suggest using a Dremel and not a drill bit. So uh, how, why? First of all, there's other stuff in there. I can see exposed electronics. You almost destroyed a $500 iPhone. Almost. Or $400. Why did I do cost it? Now. You did it because you probably have four or five different sets of headphones that you want to fit well, in there, Well, the whole idea right? of like shaving off, like two of the sets of the headphones I have, there is no way to shave it. I didn't feel like, you know, changing the jack on every headphone, right, right. dremeling the outside of every headphone jack. What about a little adapter, though? I've seen the little tiny adapters you can buy. Yeah, and then you either end up with an extra three feet of cord or a thing sticking out of the right. top of this that makes it that much more likely that you're going to mm -hmm. break the jack. I just wanted to see if I could do it. Yeah, it's cool. I yeah. mean, I'm glad you didn't break it. Me too, actually. That's a, that's a little ballsy. <laughs> you, you put the sack on the table for this one, because I don't think I would have done that with my, with my iPhone. <laughs> well, we can. I got the no, no, school. no. My iPhone you will stay with me, and we will not be touching with the Dremel. But Are you I, sure? I can appreciate yours looking like that. <laughs> That's a scary thought. Uh, viewer comments? Yes. Uh, do we have a bag of viewer comments? How do we do that? Actually, it's right up here. All right. First email <laughs> from amazing. Joseph. He writes in, yeah, we have technology. We have it right on the screen. I've downloaded the GOM player. GOM or GOM? GOM? We'll call it the GOM. GOM. I like GOM. It sounds more hardcore. Gom. GOM player, uh, but when playing high quality move files, it's horribly sluggish. I was watching the Totally Rad Show in HD, which plays perfectly fine on QuickTime, but for some reason, when I played on the GOM player, it becomes a slideshow. Why is that? Yeah, well, basically, it's an issue with having an optimized codec that's running inside the GOM player. Mm -hmm. We say GOM or GOM? Which one are we going to GOM. GOM. GOM sounds like GOM. GOM. So GOM is a free media player for Windows. It supports a bunch of codecs. Mm -hmm. According to the developers, GOM relies on direct show filters, which are basically part of Windows, to play QuickTime files. So any QuickTime codec that supports direct show should work with a GOM player or GOM. Mm -hmm. We're going to do a GOM, right? Yeah, sure. I thought we did. It's a little... Change it up. It's daunting. But many, many new QuickTime formats actually don't support direct show and therefore cause issues when played through GOM. So basically, they don't have anything in the works right now, so you may be better off using QuickTime for some of the larger, heavier, gnarlier MPEG-4 files. Yeah, do you ever use uh, VLC at all? Yes. OK, you're a big fan? Big fan. That's I, kind of my, my standard default player for all my media on my computer. Well, what's interesting about, I think part of the reason like, you know, Roger brought that up as the uh, GOM is the free file of the week last week is because it's, it's so much lighter and so much less. Because it's, it's like VLC is this amazing tool, right? I've had it play uh, pre-recorded DVDs that like no commercial player would play for right. reasons, you know, bad menuing issues and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like a Swiss Army knife. It's got all the codecs. But, you know, you look 
look at it, it's just it's got the user interface of Doom right. until you get the video up and running. Yeah, I mean, I, GOM's much more friendly. It it, it reminds me of uh, remember when Real Player just got so bulky, never no mm -hmm. one ever installed it anymore. Then with all the hacks, the lighter weight kind of right. fake Real Players. Well, I mean that's I'm what's so glad that's gone. Who, yeah. who, I haven't seen a site with Real on it in forever, and they're, I'm, they're I'm happy there. about that. They're still making money at Real. I know. Kind of scary. I don't know how they do that. All right, Aaron writes in. Oh, you uh, know, Gom actually the other really good reason to use it is mm -hmm. also plays Flash FLV that you've downloaded. Nice. Yeah, it's Sweet. pretty. It's a nice little tool. Aaron writes in. I watch a lot of Revision Three shows, including Techzilla from the beginning, but this is the first time I feel the need to mail you guys. Drobo reviewed, then a couple of episodes sponsored by Drobo, then the Drobo share reviewed in the same episode sponsored by the company that makes the Drobo. Whatever happened to journalistic integrity? I can't take any of your reviews seriously now knowing that you're reviewing the sponsor's hardware and review may be biased as a result. Aaron. Uh -oh. Okay. Don't um, get Pat started. <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing, right? We, we, there's a couple ways to distribute video online. You can give it away. Right. And, and you know, if you're wealthy, you can support the bandwidth on that. Right. Which um, people don't realize is insanely expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Especially for everybody that's downloading that, that, that you know, gigantic 700 megabyte file, that costs. That's, that's, there's tens of thousands of you, and that's a really interesting number to see on a monthly basis. Yes. Um, we want to give you the biggest, fattest, most amazing files that you want to download. And BitTorrent is an alternative, but it's a, prob it's a problematic alternative. I love the idea of doing everything by BitTorrent, but it's just not practical right now. That said, we could charge you for the video, which works great for porn and doesn't seem to work for anything else in terms of video online, uh, including actually pre-recorded movies, because mm -hmm. there's lots of movie services that no one seems to use. Right. Uh, or we can do advertising. Now, what's weird about, you know, we did advertising, actually, well, you and I worked together at the Screensavers. Mm -hmm. uh, I got like eight years of magazine reviewing before that. And there's always advertising you know, that's going to be related to what you're covering in mm -hmm. the magazine. And a lot of stuff, one of my favorite emails, I got this angry, blistering email on the screensavers. It was like, you guys are tools of Intel because they advertise in your program. And what was really funny is we never had a right. feed in the set that oh, let us totally. know what the advertising was. And anybody that ever came to a live show would see that because during right. the commercial breaks, it would essentially just go down and we'd see black screens. We'd have right. no idea if we were if Microsoft had just played, then we would come on the air and slam Microsoft. Exactly. Like, but it was, it, was, it was that was kind of the best way to do it. But yeah, and it's a great way to do it. And part of what was so funny about that email, it was the, it was like the day after I basically told people to buy AMD processors and not Intel processors because ah. the, you were getting so much more performance for your money. And mm -hmm. I was like, dude, watch the show. Yep. Now, Aaron. It is problematic, right? Um, because you look at it, and I like to think that if you know, um, I was basically a tool. Uh, pimp was the other word that another email wrote in of the advertisers. I wouldn't do things like tell you about competing products that you know actually include. Because we were talking about the, sh the Drobo share, and it's two hundred dollars on top of the five hundred dollar Drobo with no hard drives. And I'm like, you know what? If price is your primary concern at that point, start looking at stuff. Um, you know, I'm having a, a, a brain spasm. Uh, Buffalo's uh, TerraStore, mm -hmm. which is $700 with a terabyte worth of hard drives, right. $1,300 with two terabytes of hard drives, and has the networking and everything built in. Mm -hmm. Can't do USB, you know, has issues addressing hard drives of different sizes. Um, but I'm bringing all this up to say, Aaron, like, look, um, I hear where you're coming from, and Aaron and, and a few other people emailed back and forth. Um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna maintain as much editorial integrity as we can because if you guys don't trust me, the show's gonna go out of business because nobody's gonna watch it. So trust me, I'll give you the best read we can, and we will do our best uh, to make sure you guys honestly believe that we're not being influenced Sweet. by the advertisers. It's pretty funny at Tech TV they used to offer. I remember like some of the vendors would come in and kind of offer some stuff. You were always one term down, like please let me have that free video card, but we could never do it. Yeah, and so. you know what? We you know we basically we get stuff on loan. It goes back to the vendors. We don't take free. Products. Products, you know, we get stuff for review, it goes back. Um, you know what, we're as editorially independent. It's weird because we're reading ads, and I know that's a little weird for a lot of you, but um, it's how we can pay for the shows right now. So if you got ideas for paying for the shows, fire them out to us, Texilla at revision3.com, because we want to hear them. Good stuff coming up after the break, including look at the ways to boost your cell phone signal. Right, basically, we're talking about Wilson's amplifiers. It's a very big truck stop item. Okay. Drobo, by the way, to get our commercial on, our sponsoring moment, is the world's first storage robot. It is infinitely expandable and provides RAID-like reliability without the technical hassles of RAID. Key features of Drobo include self-monitoring, self-healing, and an easy-to-understand visual status and alert panel. Drobo is the easiest way to protect your data, and it expands forever. It's award-winning and has the highest CNET rating for storage ever. And you can save $50 by mentioning the discount code TechZilla when you check out at the Drobo store. All right, you buy something. It's a cell phone, it's an iPod, it's a Zoom, it's a portable media player from 
koan, whatever it is. They're small, they're breakable gadgets. You want to be careful with them. You may not want to get a case, but you should almost always protect the screen. Why? To keep it from getting scratched or nicked or just trashed, especially if you're the kind of person that takes their iPod and throws them in a knapsack full of dirt or at least I am. Um, one of my favorite pieces of protective gear, um, and we are actually, we picked up some replacement uh, versions of it from, uh, from Macworld, because they were selling them on the cheap, is called the Invisible Shield. And I want to show you that. I've used this before, and I did something really silly uh, right before this. Mm -hmm. um, it's installed on here. It's basically uh, a polymer that was originally invented to go on the front of, uh, what do we call those things? Uh, uh, rotors on helicopters. Okay. Right. So that's like the angle they hit you with. It's the miracle polymer that protects right. America's military helicopters. Right. You know, it's it's got a very kind of, uh, it's got a very kind of, uh, uh, what's the word for it? Like I'm at the state fair kind of thing, and it actually works really well. Now this is really kind of stupid to do because I'm going to end up with a bunch of blue spots next time I try to look at my. Uh, right. Next time I try to like look at the web browser on this. Now, the, but, I mean, the, the iPhone itself is made out of glass, right? So a pin's really not going to damage it just by tapping it like that. Well, it's not going to damage it, but what's interesting is this is going to protect it. Like, if I get the X-Acto knife out, I can definitely cut through it with the X-Acto knife. Hold on a second. We've had some uh, crushing issues with my uh -oh. browser on here. I thought, I thought the pin took it out. No, actually... Uh, here we go. It's a lovely picture of a 1982 Volvo wagon. Um, but you can actually, you can see where I've actually drawn on this. Mm -hmm. And this is a really dumb thing to do because I'm going to have to buff this out later. But what's interesting about this is if you take something dusty and crummy or bang it against the wood on the bottom of this, mm -hmm. it does a really good job of protecting the glass. Um, and that's basically what something like this is for. If you're spending a few hundred dollars on a cell phone or something like that, you definitely want to take, it doesn't matter really what it is. And what's kind of crazy about these guys, I think they have 2,500 devices covered. Mm -hmm. So they do iPods, they do iPhones. I mean, check out the list of MP3 players, Arcos, Asus, Koan, Creative, Disney, Iderall, Hire, iRiver, Kaiser, Olympus. So Olympus they've makes... essentially made custom like cuts for these different pieces of glass or, or plastic that are out there. Exactly. Now, I dropped my iPhone face down and actually landed on a rock, smashed the glass. This is going to offer any type of shock resistance or any type of, I mean, I don't, I don't think there's enough it's so thin, there's, yeah. nothing, there's not really much there. So I don't think there's enough material there to, to, to protect it if a rock hits it. Right. But You're talking about nicks and, and things like that, right? Like well, if you ever had an MP3 player and the lens got all scuffed up mm -hmm. because, you know, there was dirt in your bag or, or, you know, you left it face down on a table that somebody had salt on. I mm -hmm. saw somebody do that with a brand new cell phone a couple years ago. They, like, put it down in a diner. They picked it up and you heard the scrunching noise and then they just basically had sanded lines across the front of it. Ah. It's going to protect it from stuff like that. Yes. And it's... You know, they change, like the face plate, a full full face is usually about uh, fifteen dollars, um, mm -hmm. and they send it in a strange little kit like this. And what you do is basically they have a sticky side to the polymer. It's a lot like applying graphics to a car, and you peel the. It's going to be really hard to do. This is designed for the back of the iPod, which I don't really care about protecting. Oh, but, see, actually, I would like that. I, I've gotten a lot of scratches in the back and sides, but is it is it seem a little like? Bulky well, you know what's or? interesting is what's kind of nice about it is the. Uh, a lot of devices like the iPhone, where they're shiny on the back, it's that's, they fall out of your hand really easy. Right, right, right. And this is going to give you some texture to hold on to. But it's a pretty basic system. You spray on here. Want to flip that over real mm -hmm. quick? Sure. You spray on the back of the device, mm -hmm. and you lay it out. And I'm not going to do this permanently. We're just going to play around with this for a second. And you match up everything you want to match on here. Uh -huh. And then you take the little squeegee that comes in there, and you squeegee out the air bubbles and the excess water. Oh, I see. That's pretty cool. And then as the water, basically, the water's going to dry out in about 24 to 48 hours. Mm -hmm. And you end up with this layer of plastic wrapped around the show. It feels a little bit more grippy than, than just by itself. So I gotta, I mean, I've actually been looking for the hardware stores out last time I went in. I'm just going to put a big stripe of friction tape, like hockey stick Get tape. Get some on the uh, back grip of it. tape, some skateboard grip tape. Exactly. Well, back. that's a little, like, I don't like sanding my fingerprints off. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you want it super grippy. No, absolutely. But it's like, you know, if you hold it on there, it's going to protect your screen. Um, they make them for just about anything, which is nice, because so many of the, the vendors out there, they basically make like, you know, they have like a little screen cover for like two cell phones and maybe an iPhone or not iPhone and iPod. Mm -hmm. um, what's nice about, uh, what's nice is about, uh, um, Invisible Shield is they have it for literally a couple thousand, like two or three thousand devices. So it's cool. pretty cheap, uh, especially if you've ever actually tried to buff uh, damage out of the front of an iPod screen. So at 15 bucks, you're recommending it? At 15 bucks, I'm recommending it. 
It's you know what I've 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 used this on two iPods. It's pretty bomb proof. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you may not like the you may not like the the texture of it, but uh, man, it's it's pretty pretty easy to apply and works pretty well. Well, I have to say that uh, I've I've used some of these kind of screen shields in the past. You remember with the old trios and things like that? You buy them at the computer store. It was like a kind of, sheet of plastic. It was like a sheet of plastic, and it, it, you could really tell that it was on there. It was really clunky. This is something. This is the first thing I've actually touched where it doesn't feel like you've actually applied anything until you look really closely. So yeah, I don't uh, think it interferes it, with using it. I don't yeah, think it's I was frustrating. Just say, in that regard, it's pretty uh, cool. And yeah, 15 bucks compared to like trashing your screen and spending hours buffing it out or buying a new one. That seems yes. like a pretty good deal. Especially when you spend so much for the device to begin with. Yeah, remind me not to draw on it with a pen though. Yeah, <laughs> that's gonna take a while <laughs> the to pull out of there. The pen breaking it down. Well, maybe I can. Well, no, it's actually just drawing on the surface. Great. Yeah. You know, I should be waiting for my child to be old enough to do this stuff, not doing it myself. <laughs> Dude, your Flickr account? Yes. What's with your obsession with stencils? Well, it's not, it's not a hardcore obsession, but it's one of those things where I was kind of driving and walking around the neighborhood and I saw on the street corners, on the kind of where you cross the intersections, mm -hmm. there's a lot of people that take and create stencil art and spray it on the ground. Now this is illegal in most cities. Yes. I think pretty much all cities. Um, but it's pretty cool because it's kind of like an underground little art thing here in San Francisco and you walk around and, and people create these really kind of unique artsy pieces of art mm -hmm. um, that are directly on the concrete. And there's some pretty amazing stuff. Uh, Banksy is an artist that's pretty much known internationally. He's the guy who did the one with the little girl floating off in the balloon yeah. and Bobby's kissing and he does a lot of, I guess we'd call it social commentary on uh, on uh, basically the the way it's been post terrorist action in London and Britain because mm -hmm. just the feeling of being sort of strip searched by the police on a regular basis. I understand, you know, I don't want to get into the whole, you know, social political aspect of it, but it, it's some pretty fascinating art, some pretty compelling stuff, and right. it's basically a design and the basic idea is you rattle can. Uh, or uh, one thing you can do actually if you want to be legal is you can actually take chalk, like right, kids' right, chalk. Right, right, Use chalk instead. Crush it up. Because then it'll, uh, yeah, over. And put it on a roller. Once it rains, it essentially just uh, exactly. washes away. So, so that's kind of a nice way to do like a semi-permanent art. But a stencil um, is a stencil, like somebody might use to put leaves around the kitchen if they were getting their country home on. Mm -hmm. um, and stencil1.com is a company that actually does stuff like this where they do a pre-cut. And this is kind of like the... If you get lucky and there's a design you like, um, you can save yourself hours of work with an X-Acto knife because basically um, you can just sort of see that on there where they've actually cut that out. And the end result when you spray uh, your paint through it is going to be something that looks like this. Mm -hmm. And it's nice. It's kind of like art for people who can't draw. Now you, 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 <laughs> mentioned, you mentioned doing the, um, the kind of potpourri kind of country kitchen thing. Is that something you have at your house? Or? No. So, okay. No. I, I, I didn't know. You didn't seem like that kind of guy, but I, uh, I, I wasn't I, sure. I used to deliver furniture for a lovely furniture shop that did a lot of that. A lot of stenciled pineapple kits there. Nice. And it's a very welcoming, very warm thing. Uh, just not really. I'm more of a modernist, <laughs> sort of clean, a lot You're of more concrete. more kind of skulls and crossbones in the kitchen. No, I'm more Black about flag like Nelson symbols. benches and Noguchi tables nice. and you know, oh, nice. dumpster finds. Yeah, so how do we make one of these? Okay, well, okay, you can buy one, mm -hmm. which is kind of Which easy. is kind of cheating. We should say, like, if you're going to do this, this, don't buy one. It's it's more or less the stuff I see around uh, around town isn't really kind of tagging per right. se. It's more like you're trying to get a message across. You're exactly. trying to like do some type of statement. Like one of the classic ones is the, the where they put like the little fish or the crab that says you know don't dump in the uh, sewer things because right. all the sewers here run directly in the bay and they, people got tired of people dropping diesel fuel. I, I saw one of a, um, a airplane <laughs> dropping uh, cupcakes instead of bombs oh, like out of it. Awesome. Yeah, that's pretty funny. They, so, they later made it a t-shirt. It was pretty cool. And some of them are just goofy. I mean, if you want to do something, let's say you want to spray paint the side of a case with lettering or you basically want to create you know, your name so you can put on your toolbox and all your gear you're going to Baja right. with. The easiest thing to do is actually um, you know, if you're lucky and you can draw an illustrator, uh, like Stephanie Chu, our web designer, actually split out um, our uh, logo for Texilla. And what's interesting about this is we've got two things here. As you see, the Texilla on the bottom is you would cut that out, and that would be that basically corresponds to the white parts up here. So you would basically you would cut the black outlines up here, and the black outlines in here, and you could do two colors. You could do the the, the color for the letters itself, and then a color surrounding the letters mm -hmm. itself. That's cool. Um, and if you can draw, that's a really neat way to do it. If you're you know, if you have a magazine or a printout you like, if you want to get it up to the right size, um, you know, the way they taught me how to do this back in the day, uh, back when I was in school in New York City, is we used to go to Kinko's mm -hmm. and like photocopy yes. like 110% thousand percent until we got the uh, size we want and you'd either tape it down or better yet, uh, 
glue it down with contact cement, like spray on contact cement. Mm -hmm. And then the, the thing that's like almost universal, what's cool now is if you have access to a laser cutter, you can actually laser cut on plastic. Right. Um, if you can create the files for it, which is amazing. Uh, the vast majority of us are gonna grab an X-Acto knife. And, uh, which is much cheaper than a laser cutter. Yes, it is, and a bunch of blades. And you need to find a surface that you will not destroy by cutting on it. At this moment, we got a pile of folders. And uh, you're just going to sit there, and you're going to cut everything out. And it's the most boring thing you can do other than watching grass grow. But basically, it's... It takes some time to get it right. Yeah, it's, you know, it's good to work with a straight edge. And you'll eventually go around all these edges, and you'll end up with your letter that'll pop out. Nice. So after you, uh, you get this all done and blown up, I guess Photoshop's kind of a requirement for something like this, or GIMP, or something well, to kind of... You know, what's funny is I was actually, like I said, I was talking to Stephanie Chu, who's our, our web designer here at Revision 3, and she lives in uh, Illustrator a lot, which is a vector graphics right. program. So if you can do stuff in a vectors graphics program, it scales really easy, because yeah, it's, it's not a bit map. It's right? all math versus being exactly. raster it's a, image. Exactly, a mathematical uh, formula that describes the thing you're doing. So if you're doing a couple colors like that, it's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. uh, what you can do, if you've got a photo you like, it's really easy to do a single color print. Sorry, I'm obsessed with like cutting my E out here. Alright, you almost got it. Um, <laughs> I'll shake the paint. You know, do we mention it takes a while to do this? Um, and it's amazing when you start looking at some of the stencils like we were showing before uh, that are out on the internet and you realize just exactly how painstaking the process was. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And you'd end up with that, you'd pull the cover sheet off and uh, the end result is like we'd have the Texilla logo that you could spray. Mm -hmm. So if you actually, if you want to do uh, an image, you can play around with a couple things. Um, if we take a look at the computer, um, one of the things you can play around with is go to, uh, we're showing the GIMP up here, Photoshop, there's a bunch of other tools you can do this. You can posterize some images, which works really well, which basically breaks it down into a bunch of colors, and you can choose that. If you want to do, uh, you know, and it's basically like, um, you know, this, is, this image isn't going to work very well for it, and you mm -hmm. can basically, the, but posterizing will split it into three or four discrete colors, or in this case, I can go to as many discrete colors as I want. But let's hit cancel on that one. Um, one of the things you can play around with is to do a single, like a single color one is really easy. Because uh, you go into colors, mm -hmm. and we're going to go into uh, the hue and saturation, and you're basically going to desaturate the picture, which basically means taking the color out and making it uh, black and white. Mm -hmm. And once you've made it, you've started to get into that grayscale, you go back into the colors and you start playing around with the brightness and contrast. And usually you want to jack the, I want to say jack the contrast up. Um, and turn the brightness down a bunch. Mm -hmm. And what you want to end up with something that looks, you're looking for basically a dis like distinct colors and edges. Mm -hmm. And as you play around with it, you'll get sort of a combination you want. But you basically want something like that. It looks very stark. It's going to make it easier to cut out that way when you just have the, you know, the white and black. Exactly. And then what you do is basically create a new layer um, and uh, you know, basically select it. So we're going to go into one last thing I'll show you. Go into select uh, by color. And, whoops, let's try that again. Select by color, and for some reason it's not selecting. There we go. And <laughs> the GIMP is working a little weird on Vista. Um, but if I can get that to, there we go. Now you can just barely see it in there. Um, and what it'll do is actually will create the outline you want to look at um, for your project. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this is right about, yep, there it is. <laughs> GIMP just crashed on me again. I should have used Photoshop. But basically, that'll output, like, basically, you're looking for a distinct black outline. And mm -hmm. you can basically compare, you know, that to the original photo. And you'll see how we basically reduced it to two finite elements, a lot of white space and a lot of black space versus all the individual colors up there. Yes. And you basically play around with it. And then it, you get to go have fun and get your X-Acto knife out and uh, start cutting it out. And that's where it gets really exciting. Sweet. We should put some links on the website because I know there's a ton of this type of artwork out there. Yeah. And there's a lot of really good examples, and you can check those out. It's so a great uh, tutorial. Uh, uh, Stencil mm -hmm. Revolution is a great source, but their instructions aren't down. And actually, now that we've shown you how to make a stencil, we want to see some of your stenciling ideas. Uh, I think Rasta flags may be very popular out there. Punk rock logos, mm -hmm. uh, those usually work pretty black well. Black flag is pretty much the easiest one to create ever. Yeah, four bars. <laughs> if you can't do a black flag logo, you're in trouble. Send in pics to us uh, at techzilla at revision3.com. And uh, special props for anyone who can do something outstanding. That's the word our producer Roger chose. An outstanding job with a Techzilla logo.
All right. We want to take a quick moment to thank one of our sponsors that keeps us uh, on the air, as it were. This week's episode of Techzilla is sponsored by Applian. With Applian's Replay Capture Suite, you have the power you need to record any video or audio you can see or hear online and save it to your Windows PC. The Replay Capture Suite is made up of eight software programs that provide all the tools you need to record radio, capture music, download video, or convert and edit your recorded files. Just visit Applian.com slash Techzilla and discover the incredible recording power of the Replay Capture Suite. Enter Techzilla into the source field and get $15 off the price of all eight programs in the suite. It's time now for our free download pick of the week, a useful, fun, or interesting piece of software that's sure to enhance anyone's computing experience. Wow, that sounds really strange. This week's pick, Mr. Kevin Rose brings us the Pounce client. Pounce. What's Pounce? Yes, well, <laughs> Pounce is, uh, is really something that we created um, to fulfill a need that's out there. Mm -hmm. and. There is a breakdown with instant messenger and, and, uh, and, and with email. Mm -hmm. And that is um, sending and blasting and sharing files or things with your friends. Okay. Um, you try and send a 50 megabyte file over email, it's, it's not going to work. You right. try and send that over IM, sometimes you get the weird firewall issues, cannot make connection. Then you have to figure out, like, you can't send it to multiple people at once. Yeah. So you turn to services like, you know, you send it, drop send, things like that. But really, those places are just a place where you can go and drop off a piece of media, someone else goes and picks it up, but you don't have a conversation around that piece of media. So, so you want file sharing on a small scale basis meets instant messages. So basically, Pounce isn't about Twitter, it's about sharing files. Well, it's about sharing files, it's about sharing anything that you stumble across that you really like and you enjoy sure. and you want to broadcast to a large group of people. So I'll give an example. So this is the, um, there's, I should say there's two sides to Pounce. There's the, the website itself and there's also the Air client. And this was a client that was built uh, using Adobe's Air technology. Mm -hmm. And it runs on Windows and OS X. And what happens once you log in here is you essentially see a stream of events that your friends have been posting to the page. So you can see here. When you say event, you mean like a message. It could be, hey, I'm could, going to lunch, or hey, I'm going to Britain, or hey, check out this yeah, song. Yeah, it can be one of four different things. It can either be a message here at the top, uh -huh. a link, a file, or an actual like real world event, mm -hmm. like I'm going rock climbing, meet me at this time and date. So what you see here is that here's a bunch of different people posting. These are all my friends that I've created within Pounce, and they're posting different types of things. Joe here is sending a message. Just uh, you know, saying something here to everyone. Veronica is posting a song for people to check out. Um, Veronica Belmont is always posting songs for people to check which out. Which is awesome. Neha Tawar is another one that's constantly pouncing. Very true. And uh, Martin Sargent, of course, is plugging his show as usual. There's his link. Internet Superstar launched earlier this week. Which is awesome. I, the, the computer uh, DVD you guy. Watch yeah, the show. You gotta watch the show, it's hilarious. Um, <laughs> So let me show you an example of how this actually works. So let's say I've set up you know, 50, 75 different friends that I have within the Pounce network. Okay. Um, now I want to send this image. Let's say this image right here. I go and drag and drop it right inside of Pounce, and then I can describe the image. Like this is a photo from um, the you know, National I, Gallery. I took blah, blah, blah. It, now you don't have to resize the photo. Right. I mean, this photo can be 50 megs, 25 megs, whatever. Um, and I can choose who I want to send it to. So I can say all my friends, mm -hmm. which means that this will instantly go out to everyone that I have as a friend on Pounce. Or I can choose individuals here. So I can choose a drop down, say, you know, just to Patrick Norton or just to my friend Buzz. Can you do like a, a subset, a group? Right. Yeah, exactly. So what you see at the top, see the climbers group that I've mm -hmm. created? That is a group that I created with inside, we call them sets inside of Pounce. There's just 14 friends of mine that are really into rock climbing. Okay. So if this was a rock climbing photo that I want to share with them, I can just share with that private group and no one else will see this. So this nice. is just within the Pounce client. Um, so once that goes out, it then allows you to basically make comments on that. So here's an example of Veronica sent this file to 3,397 people. Uh, friends. Friends. For the purposes of the right. American Well, she's, a, she's, a, she's an internet <laughs> superstar, so she has, um, she has lots of fans. So Is it, aren't the record companies going to freak out if people are sending out you know, songs from, from albums they purchased? Well, it, it, the thing is that we, we always tell you don't send anything as copyrighted material. Sure. Um, and we allow you to stream certain things that are media. So if it's like a video mm -hmm. or a song, you can stream right. it. You don't have to download it. Um, so if you just want a preview of something. But uh, yeah, we definitely don't encourage that. We're not like, hey, use this as a pirating mechanism. Right. It's not set up um, so that like, the masses can see your files. It's more for just your personal community of people that you actually know and want your to share crew, stuff with. Your friends. Right, exactly. Uh, but you can see here, Veronica sent this out, and there's 15 replies. Um, to that, so I can click on that, it'll pull up all the replies, and people are like, awesome song, and they're rating that song, and uh, I'm assuming this is something that she found online, 
and basically you can get instant feedback from your friends on what they thought about that piece of media. Now, so I was going to say, because this is an alternative, we should say that the Pounce client is an alternative to using Pounce embedded in a web page, right? Right, exactly. Okay. So Pounce on the web page is the same thing, except with uh, a, a couple of extra added little features. Um, you can go in and set themes, things like that. So I can just go into, oops, I'll start a new tab, didn't mean to. That's okay. Um, oh, I haven't used Windows in so long, I don't know how to do a new tab. New tab, there you go, Control T. Got yeah. it, got it. <laughs> okay, so um, I can go to pounds.com slash Kevin, and like, here is the stuff that I'm sharing. So essentially, um, you can see here, like here's a video that I posted in my Pound stream. We have full embeds of that video, so you can instantly watch that. This is like, have you seen this lady? Cat power? She's got like 200 cats in her house, and watch how they freak out. Oh, they're fighting. Um, what she, she comes in, starts it's like a demonstration of brownie and they motion. go crazy. But this is just <laughs> this is just an example of right. you can use this as a place to like put all of your media. So if you find a cool video, you find a cool link, find a cool song, whatever it is that you want to instantly blast to a, a large group of people. Right. And it's not about that two-way uh, communication like I am. Like you don't expect a response from someone. But you may it's, get one. But you may get one. You may get one a day later. You may get one a week later. But it's just a place to go and share stuff. With a little your less over the top than uh, than my, than Facebook. A little right. more useful. Little more bare bones. Than a, you know, it's basically it's not AIM, it's not Facebook, it's something in between. Yeah. How much does it cost? It's free. And I, I should we should point out that Mr. Rose is one of the founders. Of yes, co-founder with co -founder. a couple other people. Good stuff, man. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, we got one for you. We recently discovered an email uh, deep, hidden deep within our inbox from Daniel, who's having less than stellar cell phone reception. He says, my college dorm appears to be a black hole for cell phone signals, or maybe a Faraday cage. All signals die a horrible death at my dorm's solid concrete walls. For the full five bars outside, we get one or zero bars inside. Are there any small range, cheap cellular repeaters like the kind used for big businesses available that I could try to get some decent phone service? Uh, great question. Um, a lot of concrete buildings, um, they're reinforced concrete, there's rebar inside of them, uh, and, and maybe the concrete walls are really thick and they turn into a Faraday cage. They basically block right. radio signals. Um, one of the downsides, I guess a lot of it depends on how you define cheap and repeater. If you're talking about like a full grade commercial like trailer that the, the guys from you know, Verizon or Singular would tow out to a trade show or a state fair or something, no, you're not gonna find one that's cheap uh, in that sense. If you want something that's gonna boost the signal on your cell phone, um, that becomes a lot more likely. Um, I'm not a fan of this thing, I'm gonna step back, what are you doing? <laughs> it okay. looks like this causes cancer. Well, you know what, do you have a cell phone? I do. Where is it? It's in my car outside. Okay. Where is it normally? Uh, in my pocket. And do you use it up against your head? Uh, I try not to. Okay. Do you I keep it in your pocket down in your pants? Yes. Do you plan on breeding? Yeah, let's think yeah. about that for a second. But what, is, it, is it really, <laughs> this is something I really want to know, I'm curious. Is, is it hurting me when it's in my pocket? No, because it's not I transmitting. I don't it's think so. It's just receiving signal. Well, it actually, it's transmitting to the tower to find a signal. And you know what, if, if, if there's anybody out there who works for the cell phone companies and wants to explain the finer points of like GSM call and response, um, it would be great and how much power is used for that because it's kind of a fascinating subject. So far, the, the studies I've seen indicate that nobody's getting cancer. I just want to know, is it like, do you have it in the front pocket close to the testes or do you do kind of the back? I do the back, Ask but I've already bred. Worst, You've bred. You've bred. That's yeah, true. That's, that's, that's officially an overshare Sorry. at that point. Sorry. The, uh, the <laughs> interesting, <laughs> I actually have had a lot of people over the years ask me about like, you know, cell phones and, uh, and irradiating your brain. And it's like, if you're that nervous about it, get a headset and put the cell phone as far away from you as you can. But if you take a look at that, um, um, if we actually take a look at that, I think we're getting, this is actually unusual. Usually we get like one to two bars inside of here. Um, and I don't know if you can, you probably can just barely, no, not even close. I'll turn the phone back on, that'll help. Oh, there we go. We're getting like one bar. You can just barely see oh. that. And I'm going to put that in this cradle. What we have here is uh, Wilson Electronics. Uh, if you ever get gas in a truck stop, you'll probably see a display from these guys. Mm -hmm. And they do uh, antennas and cell phone amplifiers. And I really like their equipment. I really like their customer service. It's something we're playing around with on system. And if I fire this thing up, and uh, I probably really shouldn't have this thing at head level because this can do a full three watts. I'm so back it up again. Here, I'm I'll now have out of the here. picture. Hold this right here. Am I am I good to hold this? Yeah, you're good to hold that. All right. Um, Keeping the body away. And that thing's going to fire up. So we've got one bar, and in a moment or two, that's going to go up to five bars, or at least it did uh, earlier today when I set this up. <laughs> because I run out of battery. Gotta charge your battery. Um, well, that's really weird. It was working earlier. So to answer your question, Daniel, um, a lot of it depends on uh, 
how you set it up, but this actually was giving us five bars earlier, and I've seen it take stuff from one to two bars up to a full five bars mm -hmm. out in the boonies when I'm on for So how does it work, though? Basically, what it does is the cradle I have it sitting in, um, it's sitting in a cradle. The cradle picks up the uh, uh, the radio signal. Uh, from, oh, there it goes. It's back up to five bars. Sometimes it takes a minute or two to adjust. The cradle basically picks up a signal from the wow. cell phone. It runs it through the amplifier. Feel the antenna again for sure. a second. Uh, runs it through the amplifier, uh, and the amplifier basically uh, boosts the reception and boosts the signal up to three watts, which mm -hmm. is the legal maximum. Um, I don't think we're going to, you know, kill our brains uh, inside of here. I don't here. know, man. But this basically, is... you do it. You normally, though, Daniel, you want access outside your dorm room to hang the antenna, uh, and they do uh, is... inside of your house versions. It's working. It's crazy. Yeah, it's about three. You're talking about. You know, you can get an antenna and the kit, and they usually put like a little chocolate bar for in-car use. They've got different systems for, uh, it's about five to $600 for what they call a Soho kit, a small office mm. kit. That will work great in your dorm. Um, the vehicle kit started about 250 to $300. But it's if you have fringe cell phone reception, like in our offices here, we have the same situation. Um, it'll take it from one bar to five bars. You saw it before. It took mm -hmm. it from like a bar to five bars. Yeah, and then you can just sit back with your Bluetooth, kind of have that a little ways away from you. Exactly. Do your talking. Done. So, you know, talk to, I, 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 think, uh, I think Wilson does one of the best jobs out there. We have to scoot onto our very next segment. Uh, but if you've got any tips or suggestions on breaking free from bad cell phone connectivity that don't involve spending three to $500, let us know. Just email us at techzilla at revision3.com. Now, we just want to remind our loyal viewers that this awesome episode, I hope it's awesome, Techzilla is sponsored by the fine folks at domain.com. Start with a domain name and build your web presence at Domain.com. Domain.com offers affordable domain names, advanced hosting, and custom website design. The competition has teaser deals, but often require you to bundle in more expensive services like hosting. At Domain.com, you can register your domain name for just $8.75 and make it private for only $5 more. And as a special offer to Texilla viewers, type in the coupon code T-E-K-Z-I-L-L-A when you're checking out, and you'll get a 25% discount on domains and hosting. Check it out. We got an email from Tommy. He writes, I have a 40 inch Sony Bravia TV, but the problem is I only have one HDMI input. I'm looking for an HDMI switch that won't break the bank. The TV has 720p native resolution. Any info would be great. Signed, Tommy. Oh man. Um, this is a great question. A lot of people have this problem, including myself. Early adopters always get bit, right? Yes. It's like, it's got an HDMI port. This is three years ago. Right. Nothing uses an HDMI, but it's ready for HDMI. And then a couple years later, suddenly you're like, I need seven HDMI Right, ports. everything has HDMI. My Apple TV has HDMI. My PS3 has HDMI. My uh, Comcast cable, or my, I should say, TiVo now has HDMI. And it's like, I only have two ports. But most people only have one. The yeah. early TVs only had one. It's amazing. One of the things, if you're buying an HDTV now, you should definitely be looking at ports and looking, basically thinking about room for expansion. Um, there are a ton of options. If you're lucky, you've got a receiver that actually switches HDMI in the back. If you're less lucky, um, if you want the Cadillac of switchers, Geffen, right? They're a, sort of a commercial television equipment company that makes consumer products. Geffen is kind of like the creme de la creme. Um, if you're looking for something less expensive, um, uh, Robert Heron over at, uh, uh, Robert Heron is like basically my former co-host of DLTV does all the the HDTV reviews over at PC Mag. He's like go to monoprice.com and like buy the cheapest switch you can get. I'm a little uptight about that because I've seen some of the switches don't do a very good job because the switch basically um, for HDMI, mm -hmm. if you have an HTTP device, which would include your PlayStation or any Blu-ray or HD DVD player, mm -hmm. um, it has to basically handle the pass-through of information, and it can be a little tricky. Some of the really cheap, jank ones don't do it so well. Wait, um, so what do you mean by don't do it so well? Because, I mean, it's a digital signal, right? right. So it's not going to be like you see like crappier quality. Right. Well, it's 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 it, the quality is not going to degrade, but I've seen things like the audio and video getting out of sync. Ah. Um, okay. Or it simply doesn't work because it's not handling the pass through. Most of the devices out there today shouldn't be a problem. Um, the, you know, if you're thinking forward, you probably want HDMI 1.3 support, even if you can almost it's almost impossible to find a television that has it. Um, HDCP is mandatory because if you don't do that, you can't do. Uh, uh, you know, your Blu-ray, your HD right. DVD, your PS3. Um, Oppo, who has a really great reputation for making upscaling DVD players that aren't too expensive, um, has their uh, three-in-one switching device. Um, they call it the advanced three-by-one HDMI switch. And you can hear the tape coming off because we had this falling off before. But it sells for about 100 bucks. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't auto-switch. You're going to have to use uh, either hook it into your universal remote control or... <laughs> or you're gonna have to you know, have your ninth remote control on the table. Um, but if you have a universal remote, you should be able to program this, it's someone to play around with. Sweet. Um, uh, but basically, yeah, we've got three, three inputs here, and we had Cyberlink planned before. <laughs> 
Oh, that's funny. Now it's fighting with me on. Uh, now it's fighting with me on the second monitor. So. This is, this is like one of the many nightmares of HDCP, especially mm -hmm. if you're reading it out of a PC. Um, but you know, it does a pretty good job switching. Um, and one of the things you want to do, it's kind of funny next, we, uh, we don't have a third cable in it, so obviously it's not going to go to the third channel. Well, it was something that I just thought about before I went there. But um, for 100 bucks, uh, they say they've got HDMI 1.3 certification, and that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, totally. Um, you know, the only problem is if you have like nine devices, in which case, you know, you have a lot of money and go spend a lot of money with Geffen. Right. <laughs> that's cool. I, I didn't even know they were down to 100 bucks, so that's really good. I heard about some really high-end ones. Well, you can, there's ones out there for like $50, $75 that are kind of like no brand, and they may work. And, if, you know, if you're feeling adventuresome, you buy one from a place where you can return it if it doesn't work and see if it works for you. Right. Uh, uh, Oppo, though, they seem to be doing a pretty good, uh, pretty good job with this one. And uh, Geffen, I think, is kind of the creme de la creme. Um, IO Gear makes an auto switcher. The auto switcher sometimes they don't detect mm -hmm. only if you sort of turn the other two devices off if right. you have multiple inputs on that. What happened to Belkin? Belkin's doing stuff. I just haven't had a chance to play around with any of their stuff in a while. But we can see what Belkin's doing. Yeah. Cool. Hey, we got one last email from Mike who has a question about switching to the Mac. <laughs> Uh-oh. I've noticed a slow transition from PCs to Macs by all of the tech shows I watch, yet the shows are mostly about PCs and related software and gadgets. Is it time for me to switch to the Mac? And does having four gigabytes versus two gigabytes of RAM help the performance of your machine? Okay, you know, we're going to do the second part of that question. We'll do that next week. Because the whole four gigabyte thing is a huge question, and it's way different between OS X and between uh, Windows XP and 32-bit right. uh, Vista. But, man, okay, we all use revision. At revision 3, we all use Macs as our production machines. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of somebody I know who's, like, super tech dude that uses a PC and not a... Oh, David Randolph, co-host on System, mm -hmm. uh, the guy who built this studio around us. PC he's, guy. He's a PC guy. Um, you've given up on the PC. I have, but I, I think I've noticed two main things that you really have to be comfortable with missing, and that's, one, games, mm -hmm. video games, and the second... Uh, is like any type of financial software, like Quicken, right. QuickBooks, all that stuff. It's native, native, like perfect current version on the PC and right. Windows side of the house. When you go to the Mac side, it's always like a release behind. It's never quite as good. Right. Those are the. But other than that, I mean, I've been happy. I just I love my Mac. Why did you switch to a Mac? Uh, you know, I didn't know if I was going to like it initially. Mm -hmm. I think I, I was just like caught up in the whole Apple craziness that was going on at the time. <laughs> well, what, how long has it been since you kind of switched from oh, gosh, on like like Probably about three and a half years now, something oh, wow. like that. So before Vista. Um, but you know, now that they have like all the, the dashboard widgets that I pull up, I know how my, ex, my expose and like all my different settings. It's just so much faster for me to get things done. Um, I, I don't know. I just would never go back. I have a Vista box, like a, a desktop box for right. all my games at home. And the more I use Vista, the more I realize it's just like a pain in the ass and there's a lot of it's bugs. It's a frustrating operating system. Yeah, so I just, you know, the Mac doesn't have those issues for me. Right. Um, a lot of people actually uh, that I know have moved to Mac because I just got fed up with running uh, antivirus and anti-spyware applications or dealing with some of... Uh, uh, they just they just like the OS 10. They they get to geek out because it's got a basically it's a it's a really pretty interface sitting on top of the BSD core, which is a variation of Unix. Um, and but a lot of people just like uh, the way the operating system feels and the fact that it takes a lot of work to crash it usually. Um, and with Vista, I think Vista just ticked off a lot of people in the tech community and kind of pushed them towards OS 10. Uh, a lot of people though, if they have a Linux Unix background, they love the fact that they can do a lot of cool guy, cool gal Unix stuff uh, inside of there. But uh, you know what? If you if you're running applications that aren't available on OS 10, stick with Windows XP. If not, yeah, you know what? Think about making the move. And we'll talk about the two gigabyte, four gigabyte thing yeah. next week. Unfortunately, Mr. Rose will not be with us. He'll be back creating new features at Dig. That's right. Thanks for having me, though. Thanks I had a lot of fun. Out. It's been a while since we've done this. A long time. I know. Many years. And do us a favor. If you've got a question, a suggestion, a comment, or pics of some outrageous tech setup, especially ones that aren't in your living room, bedroom, or office, send them on in. The address, as always, techzilla at revision3.com. And don't forget to check out previous episodes of Techzilla. They're just waiting to be rewatched at revision3.com slash techzilla. And hey, you know what? We're in the market for a new female co-host. If you have any ideas or you live in the SF Bay area, that's the San Francisco Bay area, and you want to try out yourself, send your resume and headshot to roger at revision3.com with Techzilla co-host in the subject line. More details are up on the site. Hey, coming up on the next show, that whole two gigabyte, four gigabyte thing, we've got uh, a very special co-host, and we're going to be playing around with Blu-ray AC DVD drives. Thanks so much for watching. Kevin, dude, thanks for coming by. Yeah, thanks for having me. And uh, hopefully we'll see you again. Sounds good. Till next time, you've been watching Techzilla. We'll see you well, next week, or I'll see you next week.
that way, that way. Yeah. yeah. 